Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. I am Manoj Kevalramani and today I have with me my colleague Megha Parthi and we are going to be talking about what is perhaps the most significant political event in the Chinese political calendar probably for the past 30 years now. The 20th National Congress or Conference of the Communist Party of China is scheduled to be held in sometime in October or November this year, ideally in October. This is, for those who may not know, this is the once in five year Congress that the Communist Party holds to re-elect members to the Central Committee, which is the one of the core bodies of the Communist Party. And to also, uh, through that, you end up getting a new Politburo and then the new Politburo Standing Committee which is the nerve center of power in the party. And of course, you know, potentially a new general secretary, a position currently held by Xi Jinping. So this Congress is supposed to be held later this year. And this week, we anticipate that the leaders of the Communist Party will be heading to the beachside resort of Beidaiha at the outskirts of Beijing, where they will be essentially talking about and figuring out who gets where, you know, all those backroom politics that we hear about is likely to take place in this week. Of course, one of the key factors there is Xi Jinping's own position and the speculation, which perhaps is much more than just speculation, that Xi Jinping is likely to get a third term, an unprecedented third term as general secretary of the party. So we're going to be talking about all of this. Megha, I just wanted to sort of quickly ask you, What have you been looking at over the last couple of weeks in trying to figure out what's happening in China ahead of the 20th Party Congress? Hi, Manoj. So I'm trying to track, of course, all the political and military related changes leading up to the 20th Party Congress. But my current focus is on trying to track changes in military, especially in PLA. So my, as you know, I was try- trying to drag PLA's officers in 19th Party Congress. So I was also trying to see what kind of changes we can expect in the 20th, uh, leading up to the 20th Party Congress. Who can be included, who might be excluded. And of course, it's difficult in the range of different factors involved. But at least my current focus is on trying to drag who might not be included. And some officers, or what kind of policy direction in PLA modernization we might get from the officers who are included in the 20th Party Congress. Right, so we got some interesting leads in the last week, right? The last week was full of, you know, really, really critical meetings, even, you know, till last night on Sunday. We're recording this today on Monday, August 1st, which is, you know, the founding day of the PLA. So the, today is the 95th anniversary of the founding of the PLA. And yesterday was this big banquet to mark the celebration of the founding of the PLA. And, you know, and there have been lots of comments, including a republication of, uh, you know, Xi Jinping's speech at the 90th anniversary of the founding of the PLA. And today we've had much more in Chinese media about the direction of the PLA. So I'm sure sort of we'll talk about the PLA. I thought what we could do today is that we could focus on three things. Then. So given that you've worked extensively on the PLA, is that we could talk about, you know, Xi Jinping's own authority, given all the speculation about his potential third term. And what the last few weeks and last few months have told us about his authority heading into the 20th Party Congress, we could talk about the PLA. And like you said, its composition and also what does that tell us about political loyalty and policy focus going forward. And then finally, you know, there's been lots of speculation in the last few months, particularly after the lockdown of Shanghai, you know, and reporting in Wall Street Journal and some other outlets about, you know, there being factional infighting and Li Keqiang sh- challenging Xi Jinping and, you know, and this dynamic zero COVID policy potentially be under pressure. And again, last week we saw the Minister of Industries and Information, you know, Internet and Industries was sacked or not sacked per se, but it is put under investigation for disciplinary violations. So we are seeing some sort of a churn and he was a big tiger who's been put under sort of inspection and supervision. So there is significant churn happening. So we could probably talk about a lot of that. Let me just start with, you know, Xi Jinping's authority. There has been so much that's been said about, you know, 
his authority being waning in some ways, right? And there's been tremendous factional strife. And some people will point to the Minister of Industries, you know, being put under uh, disciplinary inspection as being one of the sort of signals or signs or indications of factional contestation. Perhaps it is the case, right? You know, people in the Chinese Communist Party system don't get taken down because of simple corruption issues and particularly people at that level. These are individuals who ideally had who are ideally part of networks of patronage at higher levels and who themselves have their own somewhat networks of patronage. So taking them down can be quite challenging, but also taking them down is a way for folks higher up to target their rivals at their levels. You know, and obviously as a minister, he's part of the state council and is believed to be much more closer to you know, other factions which are not sort of Xi Jinping faction. So there is an element of that, of course, certainly. But I think that if you look at uh, Xi Jinping's position in itself, over the last year, we've seen this tremendous campaign, starting from, say, November last year, you know, the sixth plenum of the Communist Party or the 19th Central Committee of the Communist Party, which passed that history resolution, which, you know, came up with this phrase, the two establishments or the two establishes, which implied the establishment of Xi Jinping's authority as the core of the party central committee, the core of the whole party, and the guiding position of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics as the guiding ideology of the party. That phrase being re-emphasized, repeated, not just through official commentaries, but also by senior leaders, is one indication of, you know, his authority being reinforced and reimposed throughout the process. And that's an interesting sort of thing to track as things develop. Another thing to see is that, you know, despite all the challenges over the last few months with regard to COVID and the slowing down of the economy. You know, since October last year, you've seen a big churn in provincial cadres. Many people have assumed responsibility as provincial party chiefs. Over the last six, eight months, there have been several provincial party congresses, just like there are there is the National Party Congress, there is provincial congresses. And if you look at the speeches delivered by party secretaries at provincial levels, increasingly they have gotten much more you know, profuse in their praise of Xi Jinping, much more hagiographic. And, you know, it signals that there is little appetite. You know, there is a tremendous upside to being sounding supportive of Xi Jinping, which is not surprising. In this system, you know, uh, seldom will you see open public disagreements. But also the fact that all of these people, despite the economic costs and despite the challenge of balancing COVID and economic uh, challenges, You've seen them implement the zero COVID policy with very little sort of concern, particularly in terms of what is the economic cost. You know, you've seen them adhere much more to the political imperative of zero COVID, which is much more something, which is something that Xi Jinping has emphasized much more than necessarily the, you know, addressing the economic challenges, which even Xi Jinping has sort of at, at different points of time said things like, you know, temporary costs on the economy are acceptable, but we need to protect lives first. So, the political incentive appears to be to sort of toe the line with Xi Jinping and the revealed preferences of most of these people has been that they have followed and they have towed the line. So increasingly, it seems that he is much more in control than people assume. And I think my last data point before we, I turn to you for the PLA is that over the last week, you had this big conference of provincial and ministerial level cadres and Xi Jinping spoke to the conference. And the conference was about discussing Xi Jinping's thought, you know. So uh, in his address to that, he talks about, it's basically like a campaign speech for anybody who's interested in reading it. He talks about the successes of his administration over the past 10 years. He paints a very positive picture in some ways, talking about how, uh, you know, China faces new strategic opportunities and also new strategic tasks. There is a new strategic stage at which China is and the risks and challenges that China faces are more complex, but still, you know, there's much more uh, sort of material and spiritual power that the party has. So essentially, he paints a fairly positive picture of his administration. At certain points of time, he basically calls on cardias to adhere to his thought. And I thought the reporting on this in Chinese media was really interesting because, you know, when he talks about his own thought, he does not name it by its name. So he does not repeat his name. Uh, it, it sort of, you know, anecdotally sort of made, uh, when I was reading it, I was chuckling that it seems that he can't refer to himself in third person. So at least the megalomania is not at that level, but it's obviously significantly there. You know, there is a certain aura that he commands. And that was evident from that speech, which again tells me that heading down to the 20th Party Congress, it's not about whether he gets a third term, he's likely to get a third term. It's about what sort of pedestal he's placed on. And some of the discussion that we've seen is that he could likely be placed on the pedestal of a people's lead. And of course, every people's leader needs the 
people's army for which i'm going to sort of turn to you and you know if you could tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing on the pla in the central committee and what that tells us about pla's loyalty and its uh, potential future focus yeah so before you know we uh, turn to pla this one thing i actually noted uh, since you talked about the anti corruption drive the head of mit Shao Yaqing was also, you know, his name was absent from the list of delegates which was published for the 20th Party Congress. And I mean, yeah, his name was kind of a little bit surprised to me at least because, you know, MIT has been very active uh, and you know, kind of uh, leading the efforts, China's efforts to this uh, all kinds of modernizations, 5G and 6G. And this US China whole tech rivalry, MIT has been, a, you know, front of that. And I actually, I felt that they had carried it quite nicely but then to see that he his name is absent and there is a central commission of disciplinary inspection you know proceedings probably hanging on it it was little a uh, bit surprising for me yeah but anyway coming back to pla yes so as i mentioned earlier i will what i'm trying to do is trying to track some key changes up leading up to the 20th party congress so there are a lot of factors which are taken into consideration while nominating PLA officers to the central committee and their role is very important in uh, determining the direction of PLA for the next few years so there's a factional thing there's age preference there's professional experience and there's performance in there's performance in service and their experience in some specialized you know operations and skills there's also some regional and institutional representation that matters but above all i feel that political loyalty is very very important and uh, it's one of the key determinant for the candidate to be elected into the you know party congress so if you take some recent example so there was this i think uh, you know notice of uh, election of candidates published a few months ago and also in you know in the meeting of national people's congress in march this year the central military commission which is you know the organization which decides on military matters and pla in china it came out in support of the two establishment which you mentioned earlier which is also your know, indication of she's consolidating power on pla so this is kind of indication of how strong she's position is even with the central military commission uh, so this is the indication of political loyalty i wanted to sort of add to this idea of political loyalty right i mean in a piece that you and i have been working on you know it's really interesting because when you know the pla started its election process like you said the emphasis was on politics first and politics in command and you know when you listen to xi jinping and sort of commentaries and state media articles on his thought what you will see is that while political loyalty is being put at the center there is a struggle for also you know competency and how do you balance that challenge between having people who are loyal to you but also having people who are extremely competent particularly as you are modernizing your forces you know i mean some of the strategies that xi jinping has outlined right you know, the strategy of the thought of strengthening the army in the new era the thought of uh, you know strengthening the army through innovation and science and technology and the idea of strengthening the army through talents and or you know highly skilled personnel in the new era it reveals this fundamental pressure or friction between these two objectives right at one level you want people who are extremely loyal and you want them to be in positions of power but given the kinds of challenges that you are going to face going forward and some of that we are already seeing right the fact that pressure along the taiwan strait has intensified you know if nancy pelosi is going to visit taiwan on on august 4th you know we are likely to see a massive escalation of some sort you know a standoff of some sort on the border with india there is new pressures the pla is acting overseas much more there is increasing talk about potential foreign deployment of the pla and all of this requires tremendous discipline so how do you get that discipline and loyalty while getting people who are competent as you are you know becoming a technologically much more advanced force is it tough not to crack and for any sort of in such a dictatorial system it can be really really difficult so we may be seeing that at present loyalty may be prioritized which can potentially have impacts on competence okay yeah, so apart from competence and political loyalty i think what is current focus of pl is also on uh, trying to you know bring out different kind of experiences and 
you if you see the trend of promotions like for example after the 1940 congress there are around 35 to 39 i guess individuals which were promoted to the rank of general by shi jinping and one of the recent promotions of chang ting chu he is a commander of air force he is not only the youngest but also he has experience in range of joint operations between air force and navy so what i feel is it's also kind of indicates so if he gets inducted for example if he is retained for uh, next party congress then it call, kind of indicates that pla and you know party ccp also wants people with these kind of you know, experiences so maybe what we are seeing here is you know trying to balance between political loyalty and the expertise which is actually required as you said and that's always that's going to be challenging i mean no force can really but it, this you know history tells us right whenever you end up in a situation where politics comes first pragmatism skills expertise competence or outcomes eventually get undermined i mean and a classic example of this is what is happening in the zero covid policy right that because politics is first you're seeing economic growth you know livelihood issues all of that supply chain issues all of that coming secondary to the effect that you know for the first time in i can't remember how long we've seen the communist party's leadership essentially saying that it's okay we don't need to meet our gdp target we just need to strive for good or better economic performance so it's indicated that when loyalty becomes the primary factor you end up having to compromise on other things because you know as much as one may like to you can't really have your cake and eat too so it's going to be challenging so speaking about this business of you know policy priorities for the pla what in your study have are the sort of modernization priorities going forward so interestingly at least from you know what i have studied it feels like joint operations induction of high technology like ai big data and creating a unified structure for not just conducting operations but also training purposes has been talked about a lot but it would be very interesting to see how that will be implemented and so this is where also you know the distribution of service different uh, members of different services in central committee at least i believe matters because these modernization priorities can be you know seen of how yeah. these members or like members from these services are in a, you know distributed in central committee for example if your emphasis on modernization it's more likely that uh, you will do uh, induct less members from ground forces in central committee and maybe give more weightage to let's say strategic support force or rocket force or uh, maybe even army and navy but what i saw at least in current 19 central committee so out of 66 members the 23 members are from ground force and just you know 10 members from like rf and nine members from air force and navy and there are seven from strategic support force so it feels like pla army the conventional methods still kind of dominate the actual policy making in pla despite the talk of modernization now this might change we don't know that that's why i'm very curious about for this you know service branch distribution is going to be in the 20th party congress so for example if we see increase in number of strategic support force members or uh, rocket force members we might can deduce that you know there is an increased emphasis on this thing despite the talks yeah that's a you know interesting way to look at things i mean my my sense is that you know over the last as much as modernization is an imperative the fact that you know the eurasian continent has again come into play with the war in ukraine with disturbances in uzbekistan and kazakhstan in this last 6 8 months and of course the you know taliban takeover of afghanistan threat of terrorism and the boundary dispute with india being live i think that all of this you know will make the ground forces uh, remain you know a critical because the entire continental focus of the pla will remain while of course maritime development is happening and will continue happen i mean one sort of data point to look at is that you know yesterday you had the banquet of for the pla day today and what we saw was that the speech by the chinese defense minister wei fangke it's really interesting because he talks about you know some of the core aspects of the focus of national defense and modernization of the armed forces but he uh, there's an interesting phrase that he uses where he talks about the need of a people's army which is commensurate with china's international status so it's not just you know 
this modernization is not just a process of, you know, what one may see as interests, tangible interests that you can think of, but also a matter of status, you know, of how you believe the kind of forces that you believe a modern major power or great power should have. And, you know, and some of the investments, therefore, also go in that context. And I think that's, again, an interesting data point for people to note when they think about, you know, that it's not just pragmatic, hard-nosed, you know, things like that. It's also about status, which matters. And I mean, this is the Chinese sort of leadership telling us that. This is really fascinating. I mean, the final thought that I have is in terms of, you know, heading into the 20th Party Congress is, you know, you quite succinctly outlined uh, what are the focus areas of the PLA going forward. There was an interesting thing that Xi Jinping said uh, at the speech to provincial and ministerial level cadres. He said that the 20th Party Congress will envision a two-step strategic plan for building China into a great modern socialist country. And the focus is going to be primarily on major initiatives for the next five years, of course. So I presume, you know, in that at the 19th Party Congress, he outlined a plan which was, you know, going up to 2020 and then 2035 and then 2050. I presume we are going to see some sort of interim targets being outlined for 2027. The PLA already has a 2027 sort of target because that is when the PLA celebrates its centenary. But from a broader sort of Chinese development perspective, Xi Jinping identified some areas which he spoke about in terms of unbalanced and inadequate development, addressing weakness areas of weakness, which I presume relates to, refers to technology in particular, along with other things, consolidating fundamentals, which I presume relates to the economy, along with obviously the political system, and new approaches and measures for solving our problems. So I presume that he's talking about fundamentally you know, his developmental goals. So he's not talking about rapid growth. He's not talking about any of those things. So it tells us that, you know, he clearly over the next five years, he wants to see the economic model of the country shift. And we're likely to see a two-step strategic plan for that, like you said. And my sense is that the targets for that will be that there will be some tangible targets for 2027 and tangible targets for 2035, which again would be useful to watch out for because those targets, you know, mobilize actors across the system. So Manoj, there's one more question I was thinking about. So there's been a lot of talk about Xi Jinping being formally named as, you know, people's leader on the lines of how Mao was the great leader and Hua was so the vice leader. Do you think that is possible? And if even if that happens, what is the significance of that? So I think that there's obviously all possibility of that happening. We've seen that over the last year and a half to two years, particularly, there has been tremendous use and reuse of the phrase people's leader for Xi Jinping. And in my blog, I capture it quite frequently. So firstly, from the point of view of can it happen, I think there is very high likelihood of it happening. But obviously, you can't predict these things. But my sense is that if this is something that is an ambition from his point of view, or if it is something that is being, you know, being done to set him apart as not just first amongst equals in the Politburo Standing Committee, but as somebody above the system, then I think that that's what's likely to happen, where he will you know, there have been lots of talks about, you know, how could he continue to remain in power if he was to continue with the norm of the general secretary giving up power every two years. One suggestion that Ling Li particularly has for, had put forward in her work talks about, you know, how he could revive the position of the chairman. Now that comes with its own challenges because, you know, you have under the general secretary has institutionally been now empowered to do certain things. So, you know, it would create a friction, sense of friction. But this sort of epithet, of the people's leader could be one thing which puts him above, you know, the others. It need not necessarily imply any institutional change, but it implies a status change. In terms of its other substantive implications, it's clear that then Xi Jinping becomes different from the rest. His authority becomes unchallenged, you know, and that's a confirmation of that. The second thing is that my sense is that, you know, this, and this is again pure speculation, my sense is that Xi Jinping's sort of approach to the zero COVID policy has been referred to as a people-centered approach. His development philosophy is known as people-centered, which is opposite from being capital-centered, uh, which is how you know Chinese propaganda paints the West in particular. And because of that people-centered philosophy and that tag being attached, he is the issue of opening up the economy, having more infections because we are opening up the economy and potentially seeing few more deaths. You know, it could be a large number. Some studies give a very large number, but, you know, is a challenge for him because then that would be seen as an anti-people, right? So I think that that also means is one reason why we're seeing some degree of it's become a legacy issue for him. 
and it so i'm sort of trying to connect these dots to say that therefore i think it is likely that you will see him getting that epithet of the people's leader and again this the implication of it is essentially that he becomes somebody who's above the rest who has a direct you know who's the party's projecting as having a direct connection with the people which again sort of you know down the road who knows how things go but it sort of puts him also separate from the party right he is somebody who's the people's leader and who doesn't necessarily therefore even need the party at least philosophically practically of course he does and also the fact that xi jinping is a party guy and believes that the party is his instrument unlike mao at least during the cultural revolution so i think that you know it creates this sort of creates its own imbalances down the road depending on how things develop but at least in the short term what it does is that it puts him above the rest of them it makes his authority unquestionable you know today at least we are seeing some degree of questioning of the zero covid policy of specific measures it becomes that much more harder for groups to mobilize against him, you know and i think that's what's the most important significance and it tells us as observers from the outside that you know it becomes a certainty that as long as xi jinping is alive he will be at the helm of chinese politics and i think that's probably the biggest thing that's interesting cool so with that i think we'll call it a day for today again there's still a couple of months to go for the party congress to happen there's still lots of developments so we'll probably come back to this subject sooner or later you know down the road but yeah for folks who are tracking what's happening in china i would recommend that you subscribe to our multiple newsletters which are on our website you know megha does one focusing on chinese information warfare conversations and technology development in the armed forces please follow the work that she's been doing on tracking the pla in the central committee we're expecting new sort of data points to come out of that which can hopefully inform further research for the next 5 to 10 years hopefully if we can actually get things done and of course the work that i've been doing with tracking the people's daily and also you know our institutional weekly eye on china newsletter so there's lots of china related content at the shishi library if you're interested uh thank you so much mega thank you so much manoj if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow ivm on social media The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila Inst or our website takshashila.org.in.